This hearing will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with chapter 107 of the acts of 2022, which extended the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGLC 30A 20 until March 31st, 2023. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in this hearing should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the hearing in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation details noted below. And they are so. Thank you, Emily. Okay. Hi, John. John. Hello, good evening. Hi, we don't we don't have um, our name tags here. So I'm Denise Annalee. I mean, you can Rachel Blaine. Speak up when they do need to. Yeah, this is Andrea. Yourself. Kathy Wetroba. Emily Gaylord. We will have name tags just in case. They'll, they're coming. OK. Um, so let's see, I'm opening the hearing for the Veterinary Emergency Services Hospital, also referred to as VESH. I'll be chairing the meeting as our esteemed chair has laryngitis. So, <laughs> so I'll be doing that. And in case we have any public who come. Uh, so notice is hereby given that the Deerfield Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 14th at 7 p.m. on an application filed by Veterinary Emergency Services Hospital for site plan approval for property located at 141 Greenfield Road, map 141, lot eight, to construct a 50 space parking lot with independent stormwater management as provided by zoning bylaw 179-5412 and stormwater bylaw 155 through 156. Application documents are available for review in foyer of municipal offices or online at www.deerfieldmass.com. Yes. So, Amy, just a question. Um, have you sent letters to the butter? Yes, I sent letters yep. to all the okay. butters. And we have, you did all the necessary postings. Yes, I did all the necessary Great. postings. Okay. So, I'm going to, we have an empty room here, John, but <laughs> <laughs> I can ask people, anybody who does show up, please speak or including the board, speak one at a time, follow Deerfield Code of Conduct, be respectful, considerate, courteous, concise, non-repetitive, and recognized by the chair. And board members, just please refrain from during the hearing, whispering and passing notes with the exception of Anna Lee, who will probably have to pass notes since she can't speak. All right, okay, just the process for the public hearing. Um, the applicant or applicants, professional consultants will introduce the application. Uh, the board will ask questions of the applicant or the consultants and public comments, responses. Okay, public comment will happen. I don't see any public, we may have someone online. And the responses from the planning board will be heard during discussion, not during the public comment. All right, so, and anybody in the public, please identify your name, address, and adhere to the guidelines above. And then we'll have a closing statement by the applicant. Okay, so I'm going to ask John to please give your presentation. Certainly will. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I'm John Furman. I'm the office manager for VHB in Springfield, and I'm also the uh, engineer of record for the site plans and the documents that you have in front of you for the VESH parking lot uh, expansion. Um, I'm hoping I'm able to share my screen. Give it a shot, and I am. Excellent. OK, I have a number of documents that I'll, I'll be um, uh, rolling through. So we'll start with the site plans. So this is the set of, of plans that you have in front of you, and it is for a parking lot expansion for VESH at 141 Greenfield Road. Uh, from a historic point of view, um, we have already appeared before the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, and we have received an update to the special permit for the project. Um, the special permit update was required because uh, this expansion would change 
the site plans that were attached to the original special permit for that use. So the use hasn't changed, it's just really kind of updating the documents. And so the site plans now match that special permit. So the next step in the, in the, uh, the permitting field is to obtain uh, site plan approval from the planning board for both the site plans and the stormwater. And we have an application uh, being prepared for the Conservation Commission as well for work in the buffer zone of a regulated area. And I'll point those out to you as we go through. So this is just our cover sheet. It just outlines the documents and plans that are in the, um, uh, uh, the plan set. I'm assuming you're seeing our site plans. I should ask. I've been tricked by that before. Yes, we are. OK, great. Uh, this next sheet is just our standard notes and abbreviations that appear through the set. Uh, there's really nothing specific in here, so I'll just skip over those. The, the next plan is the overall plan. Um, and uh, the purpose of this is to show the location of the project, the existing and proposed project in relation to the property line. And you can see that the, the VESH parcel is quite large. They're really only using about a third of it uh, here. And there are resource areas uh, basically ringing uh, the sides of it. So uh, the next uh, sheet you, is- I'm sorry, John, could you orient us relative to the sure. road? Yep, so this is the driveway right here. Okay. Yep. And uh, mm -hmm. route five and 10 would be uh, running on an angle right here. Yep, thank you. All right, okay. So this is uh, an enlargement of the, basically the developed area on the, on the property, I'm, I'm going to try and zoom up here. If it'll let me. I guess I have to use the buttons. Let's not let me do that. Oh, let me. There we go. I had a. I had a. Uh, um, window in the way. All right. So this is an enlargement of the uh, developed area. So you can see the existing building that you're, we're all familiar with when you go on site. And when you come in the driveway, the parking lot continues straight. And this is the current parking field, which ho holds about 51 uh, cars. Uh, what we are proposing to do is, uh, as you drive in on the right side, this is a grass field. We're proposing to fill this and construct a, a parking lot expansion. And then our own uh, stormwater management uh, system for this parking field. And we, uh, we did this for a specific reason. Um, the existing detention basin for the, uh, the center is here and it's already sized for all of this impervious area. Um, getting this water over to this basin here was a little bit of an effort. Uh, in addition to that, this basin has not been maintained. So it needs to have some rework done, which we're proposing as part of this application. So creating a separate standalone stormwater management basin for this lot allowed two things. The first is that it allowed this basin to be uh, independently um, uh, maintained and updated while this construction was going on. And there is an expansion that will be happening at the VESH Center um, in the immediate future. Um, and this allowed us to extend a uh, connection uh, for what might happen with that expansion. We really don't know what that is yet, but we're just making provisions. So this is the layout. Uh, one of the uh, items that we did have to do uh, was, was with the increase in parking. We had to reorganize the ADA spaces in front of the building because we were no longer compliant under the ADA code with the number of ADA spaces in the expansion. So we're basically adding two, uh, two ADA spaces. Okay, the next plan, oops. The next plan is our uh, grading and drainage plan. And uh, you can see shaded out in this area here are the existing collection pipes that uh, collect water from the existing field and bring it into the basin. VHB was the original designers of this facility back in 2005. So we have all the records and we know what this basin was supposed to look like. So we basically superimposed it 
on here. And then we have a note that one of the reference drawings in the back of the set is the original construction drawing. So the contractor just has to dig this out and, and recontour it to match that. What this project does is you can see the existing curb line, we're saw cutting it and we're removing it and basically constructing uh, a new parking area here by filling. Uh, we're putting, this is the low corner here. Um, this contour line is 214 and we are at 219 here. So we're about four and a half feet of fill uh, in this corner here. So we're basically proposing to be level um, in this area here and filling in this corner. The way that we graded the site was that we're holding this old curb line as a ridge and we're having the water flow to these two uh, indents in the middle of the parking area, uh, two catch basins uh, to collect it, a uh, manhole, and it all flows into the, the basin here. Uh, these catch basins are proposed as storm scepters. Um, for those that aren't familiar with what a storm scepter is, it's a, uh, a water quality unit that allows uh, water to be captured from the parking lot. There's an insert inside the catch basin. I'll show you a detail of it. And it basically traps any sand and sediments in the bottom of it and allows the water cleaner uh, to exit out and go into the, the system. You can see we have a stub here uh, for future use for whatever that may be. And our, uh, our basin is designed in uh, two stages. We have this first uh, uh, area here, which is the actual basin. And you can see it goes from 218 to 214. Um, we, uh, uh, because we have high groundwater here, we basically built this on top of the grade that's already there. So we basically skinned the topsoil off to get down to the sub base. And then we built this up. What we have here, is an impervious berm or a core inside this area here. What that does is when this basin should happen to be filled with water, it prevents water from migrating through the berm to the outside, which would cause a collapse. So it contains the water. Uh, and uh, this white box here is an outlet control structure. So as the water comes in, it comes in faster than this outlet control structure will allow. It basically impounds the water and it lets it out at a controlled rate. And the stormwater calculations, which I'll show you in a minute, um, uh, calculate that the rate, the peak rate of runoff from this area is less than what, uh, will be less than what is there existing because of this, uh, we're, we're taking in and holding back this water. The rest of the area here is just basically sloped down. There's a little plateau area here, where you can see we're sloping down from 219 to 214 over here. Um, we have an existing electric transformer and a handhold. So we're building a small retaining wall around those so we don't have to elevate those and mess with it. And we're, again, we're just tying into grade. So none of the existing area here is being altered except for the addition of the ADA spaces in the back. Uh, this is our erosion and sediment control plan. So we're proposing to basically lay storm, uh, straw wattles on the existing pavement area to try and uh, use it as a limit of work. Within uh, the catch basins downstream of this, we're proposing silt sacks. Uh, that's just like a big uh, filter that goes underneath the grate. So any storm water that gets collected that might have sediment in it, it gets trapped in that filter before it drops through and then goes into the existing basin. On the downside of the all the excavation and fill, we have erosion control, which is a, a silt fence and straw bale uh, dike combined. And you can see that we're basically anywhere where we're filling, we're, we're lining that area uh, with that. Um, I had mentioned uh, earlier that we had a filing with the Conservation Commission and we're preparing. Um, and this is really the reason why we are filing right here. This is the 100 foot buffer zone. And this area of work is within the buffer. So because of this, uh, we are filing with the Conservation Commission. If the, the if uh, VESH could have done without these spaces and we could have altered this a little bit, we could have avoided the filing altogether. But um, you know the, the wetlands are here. There's a riverfront area here that we're out of. So, and, and then there's uh, wetlands around the back of the site as well. So 
This work is allowed under the stormwater ordinance uh, because it's a stormwater feature. We really didn't have to file for that, but because this is being completely redone and we have this filing here, we thought it would be just good sense to get a, a, a filing so everyone knew what was going on and, and uh, then we can manage it a little better. Uh, the rest of the sheets here uh, are just details. This is a section through the detention basin berm showing that core that I mentioned, uh, the impervious core, and then how the pipe would go through that. Uh, this is riprap for uh, outlet, uh, stormwater manhole. Uh, this is a catch basin with a, a, a trap uh, on the outlet to keep uh, sediment and floating product in the basin. Uh, this is the overflow swale. This is what the outlet control structure looks like. So the basin is here. As the water fills up, it flows through this grate, which you can see here. And in this wall, we have orifices drilled into it. So as the water flows through, there's an additional sump to catch any sediment that still might be in the water. And then this orifice is sized. It's a two inch orifice at this elevation which uh, holds back the water. Uh, once it goes through the orifice, it basically goes into the outlet pipe and then out into the field area. Uh, some other details. Uh, this is the uh, storm scepter I mentioned. And if I zoom up on this, you can see that outlet or that insert I was talking about. Storm water, the pavement would be right along this line here. And then this is the, uh, a catch basin top that you would normally see. So water, drops down into here and you can see there's a weir that goes around and it forces the water through here. The only way for water to get out is through this opening in this pipe that sticks down in here. So all the sediment is, is trapped in this area here and it allows it to settle out. And then to clean it, we have this inspection pipe where you stick a tube down and then you can suck all the sediment out, which are, uh, we have a, uh, our stormwater management uh, report has a, an operation and maintenance um, plan in it. Uh, some fencing around the basin, we usually specify that just for uh, access to make sure no one inadvertently goes into the basin when it might be filled with water. Uh, and then these are some other details. Uh, this is a wood guardrail. This is striping for the ADA, uh, bollard, uh, the retaining wall I mentioned, typical section, and then some signage for the um, ADA spaces. Uh, these are the erosion control features that we're looking to include. This is a straw bale, a dike with a silt fence backer. This is that waddle that I showed you that was along the parking lot. This is what the, um, the, the silt sack in the catch basin looks like. It hangs down in, so the water goes in and filters out through here. And this is some uh, erosion control blanket for the slopes around the uh, detention basin to uh, increase uh, the rate at which it germinates. Uh, this is our existing conditions survey. VHB performed this and it basically shows the piping, the existing parking layout, and the existing building. And this is what we use as a base for the proposed plan. So you can see that curb I had mentioned that we're pulling out. And then this area here is where the parking area will, will be constructed. The slope generally goes from a high point here and flows down here from elevation 219 to 214. So this area down here is the area where we're gonna have the most fill. You can actually see uh, on this plan a little bit better. This is the limit of the wetlands through here. This is the limit of the perennial stream that's running through. And this is the 200 foot buffer associated with that. This is the 100 foot wetland buffer. It gets to a point, uh, there's a small isolated wetland in here. Um, so we just uh, offset this 100 feet and we caught it on this one. So that's why the buffer kind of does that and then follows us along to the back where we, we lose the wetland through here. Uh, this is the lighting plan that is proposed. So uh, the lighting. So which? Oh, lighting? Lighting, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so the, this plan was done by the electrician uh, for the um, for Vesh working for the general contractor. So uh, there really isn't a lot of lighting out here right now. Uh, one thing to note is that this shows a building addition that we were contemplating at the time. That addition is not going to be constructed. 
but it doesn't change the lighting layout. So the parking area that's here will still be lit by the front of the building with the lights that are here. So this is really the parking lot lights that we're showing here. You can see there's a single head here, the double head here, double head, double head, and then a single head here. So we have five fixtures in total. Uh, we are very far away from any propping line, so it doesn't take much to show that we have zero foot candles um, just outside of the limit of our work. The exist limit of the existing parking lot here, uh, and, and these are, I think, every five feet. So within 30 feet, we drop down. And I believe that is the last, oh, nope, there's one more. This is the record plan that I mentioned from the original construction uh, VHB. I happen to have been the uh, engineer at that time again too. So you can see it was December 7th of 05 when we, uh, we submitted these. Mm -hmm. So this is what the detention basin was to, to look like. It had a sediment four bay in this area here. Uh, and then that uh, went over a berm and then uh, into the actual basin. And it had a very similar outlet control structure in this area outletting to an intermittent stream uh, on the side here. So the, 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 the control structure is here, the pipe is here. Uh, we don't see any evidence of the berm. So that tells us that this is all really kind of grown in. Uh, we can find this uh, inlet, but it's below grade now. So this is probably gonna have to excavate it out two to three feet in order to get down to the original um, seated area. That will again establish the berm and the riprap and then uh, filling this back out right now. Right now, when you go and look at this, this is just cattails and there's standing water in here because the outlet is covered on the outlet control structure. So it basically fills up more than it should, spills over onto the emergency spillway uh, uh, in the outlet control structure through the pipe and out through here. So that's all gonna be remodeled and, and, and reworked to what was there. Um, I'd like to go to the stormwater management report, unless there's some questions on the plans. Um, does, does anyone have questions, Andrew? I, I, have, a, I have a few questions. Um, the original detention basin wasn't maintained. Why? And will can we be assured that it will in the future and that the new detention basin will also be maintained regularly? Mm -hmm. I, I can't answer why, because as soon as the job was uh, permitted and built in 2005, we never revisited again. We're just the engineers. Um, uh, as far as maintaining it, the difference between now and then is that you now have a stormwater bylaw, ah. which has certain reporting requirements to it. And uh, when I flip to the stormwater management report, you'll see that we actually have included a uh, operation, a long-term operation and maintenance procedures, which they can now follow. May I ask uh, also about plantings? Some plants are going to be removed, the shrubs that are along the, near the curb. Are plants going to be um, placed anywhere else once these are removed? Uh, no, the, uh, the plants that are there are not of a great quality because they have been run over and parked on. So they're just going to be removed. And with the curb and the guardrail that we have there now, uh, we're just loaming and seeding everything. All right, uh, Kathy. Hi, this is Kathy Wachoba. So there's, you need four and a half feet of fill. Yes. And that's for the entire project. That's all that's coming in for the whole project? Uh, yeah, well, it's it's at the lowest point, it's four and a half feet through here. As you start going up here, uh, the high point is 219, and this contour is 216, so there's three feet there. As you get down over here, this is elevation 219, and this is 218, so there's a foot here. So it's kind of a, a wedge that goes from zero to four and a half feet. With various amounts incrementally along the way. Like yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a slope. So we're basically taking an area that's sloped yep. and we're making it level. So we're starting at zero. And as you go down the slope, it gets bigger, deeper. 
Right. And so that fill, if you were to put it in a percentage, what do you think the percentage would be in terms of the size of the project? Uh, percentage of the of the project? Yeah, like six percent, ten percent. How many yards? Yeah, how many yards? Or how many yards? Oh, how many yards? Uh, well, hang on, I can do a quick calculation for you. Because we look at percentage. So the parking lot is, uh, let's see, it's uh, plus uh, 24, and we'll times that by uh, 180 plus, uh, plus 48. So uh, 78 times uh, 225. So it's the parking lot itself is about 17,550 square feet. So if we assume an average depth of uh, two and a half feet, zero being at this side, four and a half being at this side. So, you know, an average being in that uh, times uh, 2.5, divide that by 27. So that's about 1,620 cubic yards. Give or take. Okay. Is that good? Okay. I'm going to ask a question for Annalee, and then I have a number of questions. Um, will you have electric charging stations? Do we you... will not. No, you won't. That's correct. Hmm. How come? Uh, I think the, uh, the, the main reason is, is that as a, a, a business where people come on an emergency basis for their, their uses, they're not here uh, on a long enough time frame to really get any benefit from them. Um, so they're, they're looking at just regular cars. Mm -hmm. And we, we aren't touching the building. Um, so in order to put charging in, we would have to actually get into here and run new services out to this area. So they've elected not to do those. Okay, but if you did increase the building size at some point, you would consider electric charging stations? We would, and I think that the problem with the, the addition that I had shown on the electric plan or on the lighting plan was that the addition was right here. And when uh, you looked at it from a veterinarian perspective, the comment was was that the 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 flow through the <clears throat> the building was being haphazard. It didn't like you know you didn't uh, welcome patients and then go to a prep room and everything else. You were just running all over. So that's kind of why they abandoned this building. So if there is a, a, an expansion to the to the building, it would be a new building on this corner of the lot with this one being repurposed. So with this building uh, being brand brought here as brand new we would have the ability for a new electric service and everything else to support something like that. Okay, great, thank you. So yep. I've got some additional questions um, and you may have answered these already, but on page 14 of the regulatory compliance, um, you've got peak distribution rates go down substantially from the existing. Can you explain, or did you already say, is that? Is that, is that on the stormwater report? Uh, yes. Okay, I was gonna to get to that next, so I can show you what that is. Oh, okay, okay. Um, then let's see, in the, oh, maybe, yeah, I guess maybe I should wait. The long-term maintenance. Sure, I can go through that. You'll get to that, okay. And um, okay, so maybe I should wait till you go through that and then I'll ask sure. questions. Great. Okay. Any other questions? I have before? a quick, Rachel Blaine. Oops. So you said something <laughs> and it's not on this, um, illustration, maybe then one more there. Stop. So there's a, a line that goes out and I just missed what you said. Um, that goes out through the, yep. yep, yep. This line here. No cap end of. Oh, that. right here. And yeah. Yeah. You said, can you well, just. Yeah. We, so, uh, we have oversized this basin. Yeah. intentionally um, because of the, the parking area. And we've added uh, a, a, a bump to the size of it. 
So yeah. if in the future we do something out here, we can just connect onto this pipe. And then um, if it's small enough, it would fit into this basin and, and we wouldn't have to build anything else. Um, if they do a building here That's okay. and then another large parking lot expansion, this won't be adequate. So we might mm -hmm. be able to put the building in this one and then do something else with parking. But this is just whenever you dead end a, uh, an area like this, it's always good to put a stub through here. You can see we did that back in 2005. Uh, we extended a stub here because this was supposed to be part of a phase project. Yep. But seeing as how this basin was not maintained, we elected to, excuse me, just to, to start over and do something else here. So that stub will never be used. Were you the engineers on the previous um, expansion, parking expansions? Uh, there was, as far to my knowledge, there was no previous parking. No, expansion. I'm sorry, sorry. The building expansion. Uh, no, this is uh, this is the first time we've returned to this project since okay. 2005. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and before you move on, I do have one additional question. Are you planning on doing pervious pavement? Pavement? No, we're planning on doing standard uh, pavement uh, bituminous with uh, um, the uh, a gravel base underneath it. Just curious, why why have you chosen that over pervious? Uh, so we looked at this um, and uh, our experience with with pervious pavement is if you uh, sand it at any time, you basically reduce the effective effectiveness of it. And when we talk to Vesh and we talk to uh, the contractor, they sand this pretty heavily. So um, I know that the, the benefits of pervious pavement are that you don't have to sand it because the water goes right through. We have terrible soil conditions existing here. Uh, everything that we saw just didn't lead to that being a successful application. So we standard, we elected to, to go with a standard pavement design, collecting it uh, with uh, points of sediment removal and then a uh, chance to basically hold it, let it settle some more, and then filter out through a grass slope. So the water is basically doing the same thing, but we're actually getting uh, uh, sediment removal through uh, hard structures, and we're able to sand this parking area the way that they're accustomed to doing. And we know this will work. Okay, thank you. Any other yep. questions on site plan before moves on? Oh. I thought we already did that. Okay, uh, the, so the lighting plan, you did talk about, you did show us a graph, but um, what is the, I mean, I think we're concerned about light pollution and how, you know, what the trajectory is, I guess. Of sure. The so you can see in the background here, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll zoom it up again. So this, this is the existing building. You can see it right here. And this is the addition that's not going to be built. But this parking lot line right here, that's the existing line. And you can see that right under this picture, we have 5.8 uh, foot candles. But as you go out 30 feet, it drops down to two. So then that, you can see the numbers dropping down. Then you hit the addition. And now this light is showing you know, 5.6, 5.3. And as you get into this kind of a diagonal, you can see the numbers starting to drop down as well. So each one of these circles here basically shows about the 0 0.3, 0 0.5 foot candle for each fixture. What the numbers are showing is how when these two lines intersect, it bumps up. So the light pollution, as far as the, the, the site goes, won't leave the property. We're looking at like the edge of here, let's just conservatively say 50 feet, and we're down to 0.1 foot candles. If I go to the uh, overall plan, and show you where 50 foot is, it's about this line right here. So you can see we still have anywhere from 75 to 100 feet to go before we reach the property line. So there'll be no shining of any any light on any adjacent property. The, and they're LED fixtures, so they're very uh, efficient. And so they're they're pointing 
downwards. They're pointing down. Yes. Okay, thanks. Are there any additional questions? Those were, those were that's right. Kathy's got okay. her hand up. You also? Kathy has her hand oh, up. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to understand again what about the electric charging stations. The reason you're not putting them in is more because you don't have the infrastructure built to do that because employees have electric cars too. And um, I've waited in your parking lot a number of of hours, so I can say that um, they can be used, obviously, and be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, just to clarify, I'm only the civil engineer on the project. I'm not associated with VESH. So uh, I know that when we asked the question about that, uh, there was, be because of the modifications that had to happen to the building, they've elected not to do it. So I can go back and I can certainly ask them again, but I can't give you a different answer than that because I'm not I'm not part of that decision tree. So, you, but I'm what I'm also wondering is you don't have to build any different lighting infrastructure to accommodate that if that were a request from the planning board. Uh, what, do, I understand what that? do I understand it correctly that you could put them in without a major um, change in in the lighting? Uh, put, put, uh, I'm not understanding. Put what in without uh, electric charging stations? Uh, I I, I mean, don't know that. I, I'm going by what the builder said, and the builder said it was uh, a modification to the building that they weren't planning. But it could be done, as far as you know, or you don't. Is that I, not? I don't you know. You don't know. Okay. Don't know. Okay. Thank you. So we're all set to move on to the stormwater. All right. Okay. Uh, so this is the uh, stormwater report um, that we prepared for uh, the project. Um, and it, it basically just goes through, identifies uh, uh, all the parameters. Uh, we start with the uh, DEP checklist, um, signed and sealed by myself going through the project, um, you know, no disturbance to any wetland resource areas, although we are in the buffer zone, um, uh, minimizing disturbance to existing trees and shrubs. Uh, it is really a field right now. Um, and then uh, above ground detention basin. So because of the poor soils that we have and the fact that we have to raise the site for the parking area, we're basically stripping the uh, vegetation off, filling it, and then putting the vegetation and organics back on as a as a as a cover. Um, under the standards, we do have uh, no new untreated discharges to any resource area. The outlets have been, been designed so that there's no erosion or scour, and we have uh, calculations which I'll show you in a minute uh, that support that. Uh, uh, peak rate attenuations. Uh, we are uh, uh, showing that. The rates for all of the storms, in addition to the two and the 10, have been reduced as a result of the project. What we haven't done is we haven't analyzed the existing basin because nothing has changed with that. We're just going through and doing work to restore that back to where it was. Um, we are not incorporating recharge into the design because of the poor soils that we have here. Uh, water quality, we have a long-term pollution prevention plan attached to this report. I will go through that. And we have calculations to show that uh, we meet the 80% TSS removal uh, and 44, well, actually we don't need the 44 pretreatment because we're not infiltrating. Uh, water quality, we are sizing it for one half inch of water quality volume. We are not in a critical area. We're not considered a LUPL. Standard seven, uh, we are not considering this a redevelopment, even though the project is already there, this area is not um, developed, it's a field. So we didn't feel this met the standards for uh, a redevelopment. Uh, construction period, uh, we have a construction period pollution prevention and erosion sediment control plan uh, attached to this as well. Uh, standard eight, uh, this will require uh, a SWIP uh, because we're over the one acre of uh, disturbance uh, that has not been prepared yet. 
but uh, it will be prepared under the new uh, 2022 uh, EPA guidelines. So uh, the uh, biggest change in those regulations are that the inspectors who are uh, inspecting for erosion and sediment control now have to be uh, completed and certified by the EPA to be able to do those inspections. Uh, we have to provide additional federal um, certifications with respect to rare species. So we have to contact US Fish and Wildlife and get a certification from them. And then we also have to file a project uh, notification form with Mass Historic to make sure that no historic properties are, are being uh, affected by this project. So those are three new items that uh, uh, EPA has put into the 2022 guidelines. And so that will be prepared prior to construction. Um, we have uh, a post-construction operation and maintenance plan included in this. And that uh, I'll show you is what you were interested in on how the areas will be maintained. And that does have a log. We have, uh, uh, again, the long-term uh, pollution prevention plan. Uh, and there are no uh, illicit discharges um, associated with this because the, the site does have a sewer system to it. So this is just the uh, project uh, narrative. It goes through, the, the site is 14.4 acres, and we are disturbing approximately 45.5 square feet uh, of, the, of the site. So we're a small portion of the overall uh, development. Uh, this describes the existing drainage conditions, and this is kind of standalone. The existing drainage conditions kind of go towards the, uh, the existing basin. Uh, this area here is the area which I'll show you on the map that is uh, where the uh, proposed project is going to be. And we've set a design point 1000, which is basically on site, but to the south of the, of the project. For the proposed drainage conditions, we maintain that same design point. Um, you can see the curve numbers between the two have changed where it's grass before. You have a curve number of 61. And then under the proposed, you have a curve number of 94, which meaning that the imperviousness of that area is uh, getting more. It's, it's shedding more water than it's holding back. Um, here's just a locust map coming up, which everyone knows where it is. This is the existing conditions drainage map. And you can see what we've outlined as that drainage area. Um, this is the time of concentration to basically go a drop of water going from here through the site down to here. That's included in our um, analysis. The proposed condition basically uses that same drainage area. You can see that it encompasses the new parking area uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the detention basin. Uh, we are not in an area that is uh, subject to the 100 year flooding. The site is in this area here, and we are out of that zone B. And then we get into regulatory compliance, which is basically just going through the standards again. The, uh, the, and I went through all of these as part of the DEP checklist, but this is uh, an analysis of what that design point is seeing. So under proposed conditions for the two year storm, it's seeing 0.14 cubic feet per second. And with the increase of impervious and uh, the detention basin, that's dropped down to 0.13. So you, you may look at this and say, well, you know, that's not really a lot. But what you have to do is look at the comparison of how much grass was there before and how much pavement is there afterwards. So if we didn't have this detention basin, this number would be up in a, upwards of the two to three cubic feet per second number. So you can see that it's basically attenuating the peak. As we start to get higher in storms, the difference starts to become more apparent. Under existing additions for a 10 year storm, it's 0.71. You can see under proposed, it's 0.17. On the 25 year storm, the existing is 1.15 cubic feet per second. You can see we're at 0.18. And at the 100 year storm, uh, we're starting to get flow going through the overflow uh, um, area into that swale. So we go from 1.93 to 1.44. So under all conditions, we are showing that the, 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 the peak rate of the parking area is being decreased. We are. We did acknowledge that uh, due to the um, 
the poor soils, we are not able to provide uh, the uh, recharge that is needed for uh, the site. However, the basin is not lined, so there is some uh, recharge going in, but as a D soil, it's very limited. So we meet the intent of the bylaw because under a D soil that is generally a wetland, you just don't have the ability to, to infiltrate water. Water quality, I'll get to these uh, uh, calculations in a minute, but we are our stuff is designed for 80% total suspended solids removal um, from this parking lot. And again, we have the, uh, uh, the long-term pollution prevention plan in the back of the of the, the report. So we've gone through all of these, the LUPL, the critical areas, redevelopment, all of these items here, which we, we already covered uh, before. Hey, John, uh, but, John, hold on just a sec, please. Sure. Would, would you prefer that we hold questions until the end or when you're actually going over things? Whatever you'd like to do. Well, okay, so I, I did have a question. I think I sure. had a question before, but it was the wrong time. The peak discharge rates, if you could go back to that. Sure. I'm just curious. So, I mean, they're substantially different from the first. So does it, this includes both detention ponds? It does not. It only includes the, the, the new one. So uh, the drainage area that we're showing is just this. So the, the, the rate that's coming out of this will be as was shown in the existing stormwater report that was made for this project. So nothing has changed here, except we are just excavating this out and putting this back to where it was because it wasn't maintained. Okay, so what you're saying is you, you have to, since that was, obviously not adequate, you have to redo that one. So between the two detention ponds, is this what the proposed uh, peak discharge rate will be? No, so, so that peak discharge rate is just for this drainage area for the new expansion. Okay. The, the, this basin uh, uh, was designed to be adequate but it failed due to lack of maintenance. So we should be clear, clear that it, it's not functioning because it's full. So they just have to go and excavate everything out to get it functioning again. So, so you'll have two discharges from this property. You'll have this one, which is what we're asking you to review now. And right. this one, which was approved back in 2005. And right. that hasn't changed. Yeah, but since you are excavating that, why wouldn't that? Why wouldn't we be concerned about that peak peak discharge rate? So uh, the 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 discharge rate from a basin is based on the orifice size of the outlet control structure, and we're not changing that. We're basically unplugging it. So mm -hmm. not so when you look at this, nothing in the remaining area of the site is changing. Right. So this was what was there in 2005. This is what was there in 2005. The, and it's been functioning since 2005, except that it's now full. So if they had uh, uh, maintained this every two or three years, they would just be going in there, mowing it, digging out the grass, and then keeping it going. They didn't. So now they have to go back and put it back to where it was in 2005. Nothing has changed. It's still the same basin. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more? Uh, not on that point. Okay. Go further on, I'll have. Okay. Questions. All right, so we get into the supporting calculations. Um, first off, we come to uh, pipe sizing and we have a computer program that sizes that for us. We base all of the pipe sizes that we show on a 10 year storm, which is the standard for mass DOT on roadways. So all the new pipe sizes that we're showing here are based on a 10 year storm. And then this is basically the, uh, the structure, uh, the station of which that is calculated, where the inlet is, the inlet elevation, the total flow going through that, the cubic feet per second, and all of these are the, the system, uh, uh, the area that's collecting system flow time, uh, the CFS, 
uh, basically to show that uh, the inverts that we have shown here, the hydraulic grade line, are acceptable for the 10 inch pipe that we have projected. So that's a lot of computation just for those two pipes that we have. Let me go back down here. And then these are more of the same, but it basically just breaks it down into different labels. Uh, this is the uh, hydrology chart that we use uh, for determining the storm frequency mm -hmm. uh, for the for the system. Mm -hmm. These are our supporting calculations um, for the the two year storm. We're using three um, inches per hour for 24, 24 hour storm. For the ten year storm, four point six four. 25 year storm 5.66 and 100 year storm 7.24 under the uh the DEP uh regulations um the uh the DEP uh, basically has set uh that the standard rates uh from when the stormwater management regulations were were established are acceptable to be used but if an applicant has access to NOAA, which is what the chart I just showed you, uh, we should use those rates because those rates are higher than what was done when the regulations came out back in 2005, I think it was. So we're using the, the higher rates. Um, so when you look at, this is the existing calculations, it's, it's very simple. We have one drainage area going into one design point. Um, and I'll show you, these are just the accountings for it, but I'll show you uh, for the 10 year storm, I'm sorry, the two year storm, there's the rainfall rate that I told you. Um, this is the drainage area. It's got an area of 25,954 square feet. The curve number is 61, which is a blend of, of uh, 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 impervious area. It's got some, pavement in it, but if you recall that line went up to the existing uh, paving area a little bit. And what it's showing is that the total runoff uh, from this area is uh, just doesn't back here somewhere. Um, is 0 0.16 acre feet or 0.14 cubic feet per second. So these are really the, the sheets that kind of summarize everything for the existing additions. And we'll go to the, that's the two year. This shows the hydrograph of how that occurs. And then you go to the 10 year, which you, and these are the numbers that I showed you before. So this is the same area, 0.71. There's the hydrograph. This is the 25 year, 1.15. Next one should be the 50 year, I'm sorry, the 100 year, 0.193. Now we get into the proposed. And what you're gonna see different on the proposed is that we have that same drainage area, but now we have introduced a detention basin We've introduced the outlet pipe from the detention basin, and then we still have that same design point. So it's a little different to look at these, but we'll walk through the same thing. So the first thing we'll look at is the outfall or the outlet from that drainage area. So we'll go to we'll go to the two year first. All right, so you can see it has all of the area. You have that subcatchment 100. We have that reach, we have the detention basin and this link, and this link is a design point. So one thing to notice is here is that we have the drainage area coming from that drainage area before the drainage, before the flow goes into the basin. I think if you recall, I said if we didn't have the detention basin, we'd be up where somewhere is around two cubic, feet, two cubic feet per second. So before the drainage area goes into that basin, the flow is 1.54 cubic feet per second. You can see that right here. 
Now compare that with the existing, which was 0.14. So you can see how that increase in paving is actually just shooting the water off much faster than, than the grass. So now it goes into the detention basin. So we show that same inflow, uh, 1.54, that's what's coming in, but the outlet control structure is limiting it to 0.13. So you can see what the detention basin does is it holds it back and it basically holds it back until the peak of the storm passes and then lets it out uh, once the peak is gone so it doesn't overburden other facilities. So that will hold true for all the storms that we're gonna look at. So that's the three year. Um, I'm sorry, that's the two year. Uh, uh, I gotta go back one. Nope, went the wrong way. So this is the detention basin summary. Uh, to a specific page for this. So in that detention basin, these are all the elevations. These are the surface area, and this is the cubic feet of storage. So within this basin, these are cumulative. So within this basin from elevation 214 to 217 and a half, we have 6,895 cubic feet of storage. So that's a number that's going to be consistent for all of these analyses. But what you look at here is we have an inflow of 1.54, we have an outflow of 0.13. So it asks you then, where does that outflow go? It goes through the primary device, all of it. And the primary device is a two inch vertical orifice and grate. That's how you basically read this thing. So the water's building up in here and going out at a controlled rate. So how high does it go? So under the two year storm, the peak elevation of the water is 215.7. So it's right up just shy of 216. So there's about 1.7 feet of water in this basin at the two year storm. And so those are the same things that we look at for all the other storms. Let's go to the, let's go to the 10 year. I'll skip this page for a minute because we can see it right on the basin summary. All right, so on the two year storm, we have 2.52 cubic feet coming in. We have 0.17 going out. Again, we ask where it's going out. It's going out of the primary. So it's still going out of that two inch orifice. Then we look at the elevation. Max elevation is 216.62. So we're right about in this area here. So now we have two and a half feet of water in this basin. So it still works for under a, a 10. Now we're gonna go to the 25. Uh, 3.12 cubic feet coming in, 0.18 going out, still the primary. Look at the elevation is 217.54. So now, or 14. So now we're getting up near the top of the basin through here. So uh, I mentioned earlier when I was looking through that, that the overflow structure was going to start to come into play here. And that's exactly what's going on. So we basically, the only flow out of this basin up until the 25 year storm is through that two inch orifice. Everything is just going right out that outlet control structure. So when we go to the 100 year storm, you're going to see that we're now going to have more to look at. So Here's the, here's the 100 year storm. Inflow is 4.05, the outflow is 1.46. So what is that composed of? Primary, which is 0.2. Primary is 0.2, that's our orifice. Then you can see our secondary is 1.26. So what's our secondary? Our secondary is a four foot long by half inch wide broad crested weir. That is the overflow structure. So it's going over the top of the, of the overflow structure and it's uh, going into, still going into the outlet pipe. Let me find the outlet control structure right here. So what's happening is we have a two inch orifice here. Water's coming in, the water's building up, building up, building up, it's still going through here. What happens when it gets to here, it goes over this and out the pipe. So it all, all the water leaving this basin goes through this structure. We provide a rip-wrapped overflow structure in the event like we have a 500 year storm or something crazy, 
like a hurricane coming through. If the water is going to leave this basin, we want to tell it where to go. So we have an, a riprap swale that in the event this all gets underwater and it can't take anymore, it's going to go out over the swale and it's going to go into the field on its own. But, but we're only uh, designing for the 100 year storm, which is what the DEP requires. So that is generally the analysis. Now we get into the kind of the computations of soil evaluation. These are all the existing soils information. We got that from uh, record. You can see that we're predominantly, you know, D soils in this area here. Uh, these are our computations for long-term stormwater operations and maintenance measures. So these are the, the items that uh, the VESH is going to use for, for long-term. Uh, they, they will fill this out. And so they will be able to identify who's responsible uh, for this after the, the project leaves. Um, these are the maintenance measures we have. Inspect the stormwater basins annually for cracking. Inspect the outlet slope. Clean all catch basin debris. Clean the water quality units. Paved areas will be swept at a minimum four times per year. Routinely pick up and remove litter uh, and inspect all dumpster areas. Then it gets into additional, those are general items. Then it gets into sweeping pavements. These are when we suggest sweeping them, um, checking the loading docks. It gets into catch basins. So we give the general thing that says inspect catch basins. Now we have a subcategory here that tells you what to actually look at. Sediment, structural damage, uh, make sure that the grates are kept free from snow and ice. Uh, structural water quality devices, which uh, in this case happens to also be the catch basins because our wall of quality devices have a grate on it and they, they, the water flows into it. So they're very similar to this. The stormwater outflow, just making sure it's not eroding. We have riprap protecting it there. We wanna make sure that that riprap's there. So if we get an event or for long-term use, the riprap starts to get depressed and starts to wash away. We want them to kind of set that back up and make sure that it's protecting things. And then we get into roof drain leaders, things that you would do at your house, make sure that they're flowing, that they're connected, they're not iced up. Uh, the extended detention basin, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, before you move on, I did have a question about that. So through all of those on the re report, let's see, the structural stormwater management devices, how you just you're going to be doing that who's going to who's enforcing that and who's doing that well the uh I, i'll be honest i don't know what the outcome of your stormwater management permit will be in deerfield this is the first one i have mm -hmm. uh, filed for but it's my understanding that the permit requires uh identification of an operator yeah. so the operator under most of the communities that we work in the operator is the person that is responsible for the maintenance. So if the operator is the owner, then the owner is responsible for doing that maintenance. It's in this case, it's the management, not the owner. Management of the that, that's true. Yeah, they're not going to come from California to. to okay, clean. so it's management. So you know, back to enforcement. I mean, that's great if they do it. How will we know it's done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I I believe. Well, we have their reporting that when they do this. There's a report that they have to fill out a BMP checklist. Okay. So they have all this. As far as the stormwater permit goes, you could require that they submit this to you annually so that right. you have it for record to know that it's okay. done. Great. Thank you. Yep. So, yeah, I want to I wanted to follow up on that. So who um report goes to whom in town and I'm just concerned about, you know, that it's actually maintained regularly, especially since we are learning that the first attention basin wasn't maintained. Yeah. Right. yeah. The the first the first storm, I mean, back in 2005, yeah. the regulations for these were much different. There was no requirement for any maintenance. Right. So and, I and so now we fast forward 17 years, 18 years, and and things have changed. All communities and non MS four ones and MS four communities all have some sort of uh, maintenance requirement. So uh, I don't know what your bylaw requires as far as reporting. I don't know who it goes to, but as far as that stormwater permit, 
you as the board can certainly dictate in the order of conditions or the conditions for that permit, how often this gets done and who to send them to. If you want to send them to the building inspector and uh, with a copy of the planning board, so the building inspector maintains a copy, you put that in a condition and that's something that they'll have to do. Other communities that we deal with actually have a stormwater authority. Um, it's not combined with the function of the planning board. Um, I know I live in Southampton. Southampton is the same as you. The planning board is the stormwater authority. So everything goes to the planning board and they file it. They put it in the file when the reports come in. So if you have an administrative assistant who helps you with the filing, that's great. In Southampton, we don't. So it all falls to the chairperson to make sure everything gets filed. So uh, it depends on how you want to set it up. So it's a good thing she has laryngitis, so she can't speak up. <laughs> Amy, are you are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Amy. That that would yeah, that, I'd be probably doing the filing. <laughs> are there any other questions pertaining to that? No, I okay. just I, okay. In general, concern about maintenance for everything in town right I, i'm sorry who's speaking i i can't i'm sorry this is andrea yeah uh, expressing my concern about maintenance throughout town yes i think i think we can all agree on that <laughs> thank you all right go ahead john yeah. uh yeah so i'm almost uh, done with the bob so here are the supporting calculations that we talked about water quality volume, we, we are, we're showing a, a, a half an inch of, of treatment and uh, our volume is shown at uh, 889 uh, cubic feet. It's a very small portion. Uh, when you look at the size of the basin, uh, the basin, as I mentioned, is 6,895 cubic feet. So we have more than enough storage uh, to provide that water quality volume. We're just uncertain uh, what we're going to get for infiltration. So, so clearly you have an existing base and we're putting four and a half feet of fill on it. So the fill that we're putting in, that will provide some level of infiltration. It's not, a, it's not a lot. But once it gets down to that D soil, it's really going to stop and just kind of, kind of filter out. So that's why we have the basin designed to drain within 72 hours. You don't want that water kind of sitting there in the soils. We want to get it in, get it out, and then have it give it a chance to dry out. So that's how we have all these uh, designed. Uh, the next one should be the TSS calculations, TSS removal. So uh, let me see here. We only have one uh, drainage area. So usually you get, this box is in the way. Usually you get one of these for every drainage area that you have. So if you have a drainage area that has, or a project that has six drainage areas, you, you should get six of these, one for each one. So the way this works is you start with a suspended solids load of 100, and then you start working through what reduces that. Um, and it's a weird spreadsheet, the way that it works. So if you uh, do quarterly sweeping, this is good for a 5% removal. So you're starting at 100, you're removing 5%. So the remaining load is 95%. Then you go to the next BMP, which is the storm scepter. The storm scepter removes 80%, but it's not 80% of the one, it's the 80% of the 95 that's remaining. So that's when you start getting odd numbers. So it's removing 7.76% of the whole, the remaining load is 0.1. Now you go to the dry detention basin. So that really has no removal rate to it. So you bring this over 0.19, we have no removal. So we're at nine, uh, we're, so we're removing uh, nothing with this line. So what that tells you is you take the 0.19 and you subtract it from the full load of one. And this tells you that your treatment train is removing 81% of the solids. The spreadsheet was designed by DEP. It's very confusing, but it, the results show what we have. So that's how you get the 80% removal. If we were infiltrating, this number would have to be 44% because uh, prior to this line, because uh, the DEP requires that if you're infiltrating water, you have to remove 44% of the solids 
before you infiltrate. So that's another reason because the soils are so poor, we didn't infiltrate so we don't have to do anything with that. So that's how this whole, whole uh, system works. And this is the storm scepter. I mentioned how this works. This is the graphics of how it works. The catch basin here, water flows in, it goes through. Uh, this is kind of an orifice here, drops down into here. The way that this is designed, it creates a swirling motion inside the, uh, the chamber. And you know, like a whirlpool in a, your, a swimming pool, if you spin the water, all the dirt kind of goes to the center. It's basically built on the same thing. So the soil builds up in the center. The water can only leave on the end where it's cleaner. And then it comes out and then goes out this, I'm sorry, I got this backwards. This, the water comes in through here, drops down, does that. And then the water can only leave this way at the edge. So we're in theory with the whirlpool shoves all the particles to the center, the cleaner water goes out. And that's, we have two of those in the new parking lot. And then this is their, their brochure and uh, all the information that shows how we maintain that. Uh, we have a section in the report for erosion control. This is during construction. These are what we're expecting the contractor to install. These are all shown on our, our plans. So this is kind of a, a written uh, document that backs up what we have shown on our plans. Uh, vegetated slope maintenance. The biggest thing is during construction, they fill those slope areas, then they go home for the weekend, and then we get a big rain event, and they come back on Monday, and the slope is now all in the field, and they have to scrape it up. So we want them to stabilize it as soon as possible, and that's what this does. As soon as it's in and compacted, we want them to spray it. We want them to put the fabric on it, and then that way it's, it's protected. And that's what the maintenance is for this. So as, as they see a small little eroded channel developing, we want them to jump on it. We want them to pack it, reseed it, and then get it stabilized. Because that's if they don't do that right away, it's going to be a problem for the length of the project. Uh, and then these are some construction uh, inspection reports. So uh, in addition to the reports that are included in the stormwater pollution prevention plan, this is a quick hit one for the contractor to, to use. The ones in the stormwater pollution prevention plan are much more detailed. And once they get to construction on that, we'll have that. So um, what we've seen uh, a lot of boards do is add a condition that when the SWIP is prepared, a copy just goes to you so you have it on record. And that's not a problem. So I might suggest that as a, as a condition of approval if you guys want to include that. But these are basically inspection dates and, and who the inspector was for all of these items here. And I think that's it for the stormwater. So I have one more document, which is the traffic study. All right, can we go back one second to the maintenance? And I'm, I'm sorry about this. Um, I understand it sounds like management is responsible for maintaining it. That's right. And we have someone in town I'm hall sorry, who's speaking, who can please? accept that maintenance report, but who's enforcing that it gets maintained? I mean, who says that they do what mm -hmm. they say they do? Right. right. Or oh, like even like who's checking to make sure that they're submitting this or that it's accurate. I'm sorry, can I ask who's speaking? So Emily Gaylord, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I can't speak for the town. I'm not sure that's directed to me. Yeah, it's not. I'm, but I just, it seems like that's a missing piece. And it seems like that's something that has faltered before. So, right. so yeah. I would say just, this is Rachel Blaine, because um, enforcement's always, I mean, that's always the trick, right? So I think that, you know, to Kathy's point, um, who, who's going to make sure that they're doing what they say they're doing on any kind of record? I think that that, tends to be something that people report. It's not necessarily, you know, we don't have the personnel to go right, right. standing over but somebody with a lawnmower. Making sure they say what they say they're doing. You want to just, just do the report. It. Like, yeah. right. well, I, 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 if I could interrupt, I, I do know that on the special permit that update we have, that this was a hot topic for the, the ZBA members as well. So I believe one of the conditions that they put on the special permit update 
was that the stormwater be maintained according to the documents that they have here. But uh, having been the chairman of the planning board in my town, I fully understand that the planning board has zero enforcement authorities. And the, the, uh, the building inspector is usually the enforcement agent for all items under zoning. So my guess is that would be who would be maintaining these or, or enforcing it. Oh, before Kathy, I was just going to say, Emily, I think that's that, that's probably going to end up being an internal discussion okay. where, um, you know, Amy can have a checklist of a time and then we'll have to uh, appoint someone to go and do that. Okay. But that's a very good question. Kathy? Thank you. I was just going to say Come one, there. there's goodwill. I mean, you know, I think we have to go on some measure of, of the idea of goodwill one, but two, you know, on the positive side of this, you know, the best interests of the property, of the parking, of the work and the money that's going into this, it's in everyone's best interest as part of the hospital and the contractors to maintain it. I mean, there's, there's really no motivation to not do it, right? The motivation is to do it, but so that we have record of that is really the issue at hand i don't i don't think anybody'd be like you know we're gonna build this multi-million dollar thing and just not take care of it no but right, that people won't get, get busy it. and the uh, top sure. priority isn't but i maintaining think maintaining your yeah i think for our right records now. though to know that what is working and maybe what isn't and really the timely submission of that so we you know don't lose track of the multitude of things that we need to keep track of we can we can maintain a record of of that that project and how it's working and now in that particular area as well that land area that may lend insight into other areas too of, of similar buildings right. okay um at this point if there are no other you know john if you're all finished with your presentation there's nothing else then okay. if you have any more questions from john if not then we'll discuss do we want to traffic, traffic yeah the only thing i had left to do is traffic and it, that's a brief discussion we don't want to forget about the traffic yeah. Want me to go ahead with that? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, unlike a, uh, a, a, a normal project, the traffic report is prepared because you are altering a use and you're either introducing a use or expanding a use. And that act is what creates traffic. Here, originally when we did this traffic study, we were expanding the use. When the addition went away, it's like, well, what are we reporting here? Because the use hasn't changed. So what we ended up doing here after having discussions with um, Jennifer, uh, when we were going through this, the, uh, the former assistant town administrator and the building inspector, we said, let's just document the conditions that we have right now. Um, because right now it doesn't, we, if you're looking at the project as a, a bystanding party looking in, you're like, well, you're not doing anything, but yet you're asking for 50 spaces additional. So why? So what we ended up doing is we threw some counts uh, counters down on um, five and 10 and then at the driveway. And what we found is basically the paragraph that I've highlighted here. Um, and the counts are basically uh, later on in the driveway. So during the uh, a weekday morning average peak hour, um, we have 16 vehicles entering and 10 vehicles exiting for a total of 26 trips at the driveway. So what we found that if you compare that to the original traffic study we did, this is increased over what the, the original traffic study showed. Uh, during the evening, it get, gets even more. The evening peak hour, we have nine entering and 22 exiting for a total of 31. Um, so you can see that uh, it's consistent through the whole day, but at the evening time, uh, it increases. What was really su uh, surprising was they're saying that during the course of 24 hours, we had 300 vehicle, 351 vehicles entering and exiting the property. That's, that's a lot for a hospital. Yeah. Um, so what that does is when you look at a peak hour of 31 vehicles, right, um, and you have uh, you know 26 and 31. That's uh, 57. That's 57 vehicles. The the parking lot's full. So when you start looking at it and you start breaking down, well, that's the peak hour. It, you know, it might trail off or it might it might um, uh, 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 pick up. 
the hospital is open 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So that 351 vehicles is through the, the whole time. So um, it's, it's the, for the times that I've been there with, uh, with our pets, uh, the parking lot's been filled. The times that I've been there during the day uh, to meet the builder and to talk about things, People are parking on those landscape planters that used to have plants. They're parking in the field. They're everywhere. So I don't think there's any question that this place needs a bigger parking lot. And by having a hard surface with, with guardrail around it that they can't leave the surface, you're, you're eliminating the sedimentation and the erosion that's occurring because they're parking on a slope and their, their tires are rutting it up and they're ruining the stabilization, which is the grass covering on it. So there's a lot of benefits to having this parking lot, lot done. And so what we will do uh, is that we will use this document here as a launching point for a future uh, project, which may include a building addition or may include a, a new building. But by use, having these numbers here, we know that in 2022, these are the numbers that this facility was generating. So if we throw down, let's just say that five years from now, they, they finally say, okay, let's put the building up. We'll throw down tubes and we'll compare these numbers. We now have a baseline to predict what we have going on here. And that's how we'll help size the parking lot for the, the next step into this. So it really, there's no, there's no, um, mitigation that's proposed with this because we're not building anything except a parking lot. And a parking lot isn't a generator. A parking lot is something that takes care of the traffic that comes to the site. Um, we're not changing the, uh, the, the access point, so we don't have a DOT permit. Um, we did check the crash data from MassDOT and there were two crashes that were reported at the, at the driveway. Uh, during a five-year period. So the crash rating is fairly low on this facility. The sight distance is phenomenal. It's like three miles in each direction. It's as straight as an arrow. So there's really nothing wrong with the area here, except the parking lot's too small. And that's what this traffic study shows. And that completes my presentation. <laughs> Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see. Discussion. Uh, are we going to have a site visit? Is it necessary for the uh, for the planning board to do that? Yes. Recommended. Okay. Yeah. We'll. That was Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we should decide on that tonight. And then who is who will be there at the site visit? Oh, it depends on when it is. To just to us. Just us. No. Okay. Or Con -con. And John. And who? Cons -con? I don't know. That that would make sense. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going before the cons come anyway, aren't you? We are, but they usually don't do a site visit until we have documents in front of them. So mm -hmm. um I, I, I don't know um, if you want to have them. I don't see any issues with it, but they have nothing in front of them yet. Okay. I have a question. Kathy? So um, it's across from Treehouse. How, was there any effect with Treehouse on the traffic? And how far of a distance is there from the entrance and exit of the hospital and the entrance and exit of Treehouse? Uh, there was no impact on traffic for this facility. Yep. Um, hang on, uh, Greenfield Road. I think there was more of a predictable pattern when it was the previous business prior to Treehouse. But Treehouse now has more traffic on weekends and at varying times. And there, there is sort of this closeness of the entrance and exits of both of these. I was, I'm just kind of curious if there was any consideration to that. Please. Yeah, uh, if you're seeing the screen, they are almost directly uh, across one another. So each driveway has a, uh, trying to, to a shift. Left, right turn and does it? Does that feel yeah, it has a left turn lane. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there it is, try that. 
Each program is different. Sometimes you hit control, sometimes you hit shift, shift. They should all make them the same so to enlarge it. But you can see that uh, we're offset the width of a driveway, but mm -hmm. each project has its own left turn lane. Yeah. So it allows the traffic to go through. These are uncontrolled. They're, they're, you know, I know that uh, uh, Treehouse on the weekends will have an officer out here. Yeah. Um, I don't think Vesh has ever had that problem. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, I think there was a, um, a perception that traffic would be a huge issue with Treehouse. And I don't, th I don't think that ever came to pass truthfully. I mean, aside from having well, it's still growing room. too. Do you, do you mind pulling that up again and just showing us a matte visual where the parking lot's going to be? Sure. Mm -hmm. So the parking lot is right here. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. That's what I thought. I wanted to confirm. Thank you. Yeah. You can see the wetlands. All through here. Okay, so we, we do need to visit to schedule a site visit and we should probably do that while we're all here. And, um, you know, aside from that, what are people's thoughts about peer review? Peer review. Yeah. I know I spoke with uh, our building inspector and he felt, you know, I mean, because of the scale of the project and the complexity, even though it's, <laughs> I mean, you explained it really well. It's still a pretty complex project. And I think, um, you know, we just like to cover all of our bases here in Deerfield. Mm -hmm. so I think that we would probably, I think we'll continue to ask opinions, but I think we would um, has, like to go for a peer review. Yeah. I think I, if yeah. everyone yeah. agrees with that. Yeah. And, you know, in addition, just again, just to make make sure that the peer review is the response it's paid by the applicant yep. and the town of Deerfield will send out a request, a request for quotes. Hopefully we'll get multiple quotes. Um, they'll be sent to, once we get that, they'll be sent to the applicant for review. And then when the applicant has chosen a peer reviewer, you'll submit the, the estimated funds to the town of Deerfield. Okay. And the funds will be deposited into a separate account by the town accountant, um, the peer review will be required, reviewer will be required to track the hours spent on the project as it progresses, inform the planning board when 75% have been expended in order to discuss additional fence, offense, good grief, sorry, funds that may be required, and then any surplus remaining, um, with including any interest, which will probably be like two two pennies at this point, <laughs> will then be returned to the applicant. That's so, fine. That's understood. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. So I guess at this point, what we'll do is we will do that. We will send that out. To um, you do, and do you we'll... want to make a motion for peer review and vote on it? Yes, that's a good idea. Mm. Do I hear a motion? Uh, this you. is Andrea. Um, I um, move that the planning board request a peer review of this project. A second. Kathy Wittroba. Okay. Um, all in favor? Emily? Emily Gaylord, aye. Kathy Wittroba, aye. Andrea Liebson, aye. <laughs> <laughs> Annalie Wolfcoat, aye. She can't speak, so thumbs up. Rachel? Rachel Bain, aye. And Denise Mason, aye. And also Kathy. Kathy. Kathy oh, Sylvester, I. Kathy Sylvester, I. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right. So let's see. Okay, motion carries. Oh, oh, so yeah, so we have to continue the public hearing and find a date. And let's see. <clears throat> I think we're 
December is a tough month. I think we already have, and that's actually going to be a Zoom on December 5th mm -hmm. because, yeah. Go across so, the tree house for a beer if after this. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> unless, unless we held a special meeting, the next time would be January. And what date? Does anyone have that date? January 7th? No, it's a Saturday. Okay. Nine. What? January 9th is a Monday. January 9th is a Monday? Isn't it the first Monday? It's the second, second Monday. Monday, January 9th. Okay, so January 9th will be the continuation January. of January. the public hearing. And, you know, we may actually have public comment that night. I don't know. Right. And then I think we'll send you a document to, um, for you to sign to um, for the continuation of the hearing. Okay, you're you're muted, John. I take that as a yes. <laughs> yes, I hear you. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And in the meantime, I think afterwards we can set it. We can just set a time among ourselves for a, sure. a visit. Okay. So. Do you require us to be there for the visit? Or are you just going to go on your own? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that would be great. You've explained things so well tonight. We Sure. To see you. If uh, you agree on a time, just let me know. And I uh, can adjust my schedule for myself or somebody to be there. Uh, thank thank you. you. Okay, great. Well, so we'll be in touch with that. I mean, anytime we set, you'll be able to make it? I have enough staff. Someone will be there. Okay, <laughs> okay true. Or... That would be great. Okay, thanks so much, John. All right. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Great. Thanks, John. Bye. -bye. Um, bye. Right. So I'm thinking we've continued the hearing. Shall I stop recording? Our hearing is no, no, no other business. No, there's there's no. no we can't have any other business because this recording. isn't a meeting. Yeah, it's only a hearing. Because we'll just set up a time to meet. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop uh, recording. Motion. Oh. To, mo to, 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 to end? Yes. I move that we um, close the hearing and. No, we no. Don't. no. sorry, closing. continue the hearing. I meant to continue. Yeah, the yeah. okay, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> so, so I hear a second. Yes, I, I, that's yeah. Rachel Blaine. So I move that we continue the hearing until January 9th. Thank you. Second. Second. I'm on Okay, all in favor? Emily Gaylord, aye. Kathy right. Trova, aye. Andrew Leibson, aye. Connelly Wolfpool, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Yes. And Kathy Sylvester, yes. Sorry, Kathy. I'm, yeah, really. <laughs> well, I've got to look in, into the screen that I've got to look up, you know. <laughs> it's okay. There. Okay. okay. All right, and uh, shall we, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. That was what I was trying to do before. I second Rachel it, Blaine. Kathy Sylvester. <laughs> do I hear a second? I second it, Kathy Sylvester. Uh, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we're adjourned. So, uh, okay. Bye, everybody.